All right. Hi, guys, and welcome to this week's Change School TV episode. Um, and tonight we're on episode 48. Um, I can't believe we're already at episode 48. Um, two more and we'll be at 50. So I'm super excited around tonight's conversation. Um, and the topic for tonight's conversation is from multimedia to medicine to law, one proud quitter story. And we've got the amazingly talented Lynn Marie Morsky of Quit by Design, and um, who's also the founder of the podcast Quit Happens. So we're gonna have, you know, our usual conversation tonight all around uh, stories of change. And um, Lynn Marie calls herself a professional quitter, which I absolutely love. And she's had several careers in her life. One of them is being a professional quitter. Um, we'll let her share a little bit more around that later. But we were introduced to Lynn Marie by a mutual connection. And um, we've hit it off ever since um, virtually. So we're really happy to have her tonight. And actually, Lynn just told me it's about 5.51 a.m. over there. So, um, you know, thank you, Lynn, for waking up bright and early. Um, probably the sun isn't even up over there, wherever you are. It is not. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. You can watch it rise. <laughs> <laughs> this is absolutely amazing to have you on so early. Um, so. You know, Lynn Marie is a board certified physician in family medicine and sports medicine, and she currently works at the Veterans Administration, also an attorney and um, adjunct professor at Thomas Jefferson School of Law. Lynn Marie Morsky is also a speaker, coach, author, and founder of the podcast Quit Happens. So tonight we're going to be talking all things quitting and career, and hopefully um, Lynn Marie is going to share some amazing strategic quitting techniques that's shaped her career in the hopes that it can help those of you that are watching us live tonight. So before I um, welcome Lynn Marie to uh, tonight's episode, those of you that are watching us live, if you have comments or want to just share where you're signing in from, um, you know, feel free to engage with us. And uh, I'll be on my phone as per usual, checking whilst Lynn Marie is talking. And we've got some, you know, some great insights tonight. So let's get started. Um, all right. So Lynn Marie, again, thank you so much for joining us bright and early um, and our evening tonight. Um, Thanks for having so, me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to tonight's episodes. And, um, you know, you've had a range of careers and or jobs from creative to technical to now being your own boss. It'd be great if you could share a little more on just your career history and experience and sort of what made you shift from one to another. I started life as a multimedia designer. Technically, I was a video, video production major and I thought, okay, I'm going to be a video, I'm going to be a music video editor. This is at age like 20 when I'm graduating from college. And at some point in time, I realized, oh, I live in St. Louis, Missouri, video music, or like the music video industry is not huge here. And right then, the, the people I was working with as an intern, they offered me, okay, if you can learn multimedia in two weeks, you can be our multimedia designer, you know, kind of like lowest end of the totem pole person. And so I did, and I learned it, and they hired me. And so all of a sudden, I was a multimedia designer with, essentially, that was kind of like by default. It wasn't necessarily what I'd ever wanted to do, but I enjoyed it. There was a creative aspect, but I wasn't great at it. I was okay at what I'd learned in that whopping two weeks I had to figure it out. And so I thought, okay, I'll go to graduate school for it and that'll make me better at it. And then I'll, I'll like it even more because I'll be good at it. Right now I was just kind of like scrambling. Like I, I worked with some other people and they would just kind of like comically make fun of how bad my coding was. Like it would get the job done, but it was terrible and inelegant is how they would put it. Um, but this is in 98 when it went from like uh, you can do HTML and you've got a website to like, you need to know Java and C++ and all these crazy things. And I was like, oh, I like literally just know how to make things pretty in Photoshop. I can barely code and my skills are becoming, you know, like significantly inadequate very quickly. And I went to this, you know, and like more and more things were kind of eating at me from the inside. Like you you know, that it's that feeling of inadequacy every day is not a great place to sit, right? And then they hired somebody over me who was younger than me, like he had just come out of college, 
and I was like, oh, the writing is on the wall here. Like I, this is, you know, right now I'm making a whopping 24 grand. I think I was making at the time. And I was like, <laughs> that's not a ton. And I've got some medical school, or not medical school, sorry, I'm like hallucinating at this point. <laughs> it's so early. I didn't have any medical school loans to play up at that point. But I thought like in the future, I will have to pay for, you know, you know, whatever expense and at 24 grand, not a ton. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll just go get a coding, like I'll get some coding skills. And I went to some Java class. And I remember at lunch, it was like a one day course at lunch thinking if oh my gosh, if sitting through this course is as miserable as it is, because it was every second of it, I was like, oh, this is not my jam. This is so boring. And I was like, if I can't sit through this course, I'm not going to want to do this for the rest of my life. And then that was, that's all I needed. It was like once, this is the, the, my greatest gift from my genes or my psyche or whatever combination of soup makes me me, is that the second I want to quit something and I make the decision to quit, it is done. Like, and so that was kind of that day. It was like, we're not doing this anymore. We're going to, and I had no backup. I had no idea what to do from there. I literally put out like a piece of paper and just started writing florist of uh, animal <laughs> wrangler, like anything that had ever sounded like remotely interesting. And because at this point I was sitting in a dark room with three other guys, like all day like this. I was like, anything sounded more interesting at that point, but wrote everything out. And I hope this is the story you're wanting. I'm, I'm just going to, go from one to the yeah, other. Go for it. Go for okay. it. I, All right. it's, good know, it's good to know the full picture. Okay. Okay. Um, so at that point, it was also around that time that my brother comes to me and he's like, we need to actually make some money because we're not sure if our parents have a retirement or not because my dad had just worked for himself forever and my mom had taken care of her mom for the past 20 something years at this point. And, and he's, you know, my brother, very pragmatic. And he's like, I work at the West End and you are making like pennies. So <laughs> he went to law school. Um, as his means of trying. And I thought like, okay, I, I'm at this crossroads. I need a job that I like, and I need a job that's going to have an actual secure financial future and stability. And it wouldn't hurt if it came with like some flexibility on where I lived. Cause I was like, maybe St. Louis isn't the only place on earth, but I wasn't a big traveler at the time, but you know, I had some thoughts that there were other locations. And at the time I was a swing dance person. I was a swing dancer. <laughs> Forgive me. Watch the sunrise. <laughs> And, and uh, my swing dance partner was a urology resident. So like he was in his urology training, he was a doctor. And one night I was like bringing him some food and he had like some overnight shift to the hospital. And he's like, I went to bring him the food and he comes out of the, the emergency room, like full on gowned up and stuff. And he's like, if you're not going to pass out, uh, you can come back and watch. And I was like, mm, never passed out before. Like, I don't know what I'm going to see, but let's give this a try and so I went back there and he's like putting a chest tube in somebody and I distinctly remember thinking yeah I can do this like it was just such a kind of like overnight like because that filled all the buttons or the the check marks for me like it had stability um there were you were able to mobility you could move places and it had my favorite thing in it which was that I was going to get to go to school again because I in my list of like what am I good at what do I like to do like what I'm good at is always school you know, and that's one thing I knew. So I was like, oh, there involves, it involves school and other things that, you know, were on the list. I thought, okay, I'll try being a doctor, even though I had no pre-med courses at all. Like I had to start from scratch. I had to take English 101 on the interwebs because my very strange college, uh, love you Webster University, but they didn't require anything that resembled like a normal you know, their 101 of anything. It was very liberal arts. And so I had taken screenwriting and all these things, but I'd never taken English 101. And the med school was not having screenwriting as their equivalent for English 101. So I had to take everything. I just took it, you know, I quit. I ended up giving them my two weeks at some point, quit, went back from scratch and did like all of pre-med, English, whatever these medical schools needed. And then by some extreme miracle, I got into one of them. Um, but, okay. You know, I'll talk. I'll keep going the story because I will dive. We'll dive into the video of maybe where I made interesting yeah. choices later. <laughs> um, and then for medical school, I wanted to do family or family medicine residency and then sports medicine fellowship. Sports medicine was my ultimate goal. And after going through medical school and residency and fellowship, which we will also get into more detail later, I realized I did not want to do sports medicine. Like it had been my dream job or so I thought and I got there and to me it was a total nightmare like you were standing on the sidelines of football games for like seven hours and 
I'd never watched a football game voluntarily in my life, you know, and I was, didn't suddenly develop a passion for it. You know, it was not my jam. And I was like, oh, same thing. You know, like there's kind of that overnight, like, oh no, I don't want to do this thing either. But at that time I was in fellowship and like, I was like, I've worked this hard to get here. I will finish out the fellowship. You know, I had some talks with my residency director. It's like, finish out the fellowship. We'll do whatever we can to make it like less painful for you. And so I finished out the fellowship and then I just decided I'm never taking a, a, a 40 hour a week normal medicine job. Definitely never taking a sports medicine job where I'm going to be standing. Like I, I very much value my nights and weekends and with sports medicine, that's when the action happens. And so you are working during the day, seeing patients and you go at night and you sit at a game or something. So it was like not for, for my lifestyle. And I, I decided, okay, this is my, this is where I put my foot down and I will take a medical job, but I will take one under my parameters. Right. And so I was like, I don't know how I'm going to make this work, but maybe I'll work for like a medical records company, electronic medical records company. Um, I, in the, in the meantime, I was doing urgent care shifts where you could just like pick however many shifts you wanted a, a, a month, you know, so I would work maybe five days a month. Um, and then I was on Twitter, like the only thing I did on Twitter was follow this thing called get physician jobs. Cause this is 2009, eight, nine, 2009. And lo and behold, one day there was a job that popped up that was like, do exams three days a week, get paid per exam. And it seemed super shady, but I was like, yes, please. And so uh, I followed whatever that link was. And it turns out it was the job I currently still have, which, wow. yeah, which is exactly that. Like I get paid per pay person that I see. I make my own schedule. Now I work two days a week, five hours a day. But it took me saying like, yeah, this is what I'm going to this is what I will put up with. I will not put up with call. I will not put up with prescrib prescribing opioids because even back in the day, I could see the writing was on the wall. People were showing up the urgent care begging for opioids, which was not, you know, something I wanted to be involved in. Um, so I, I ended up taking that job. So that was two days a week. And that led me to the next little thing that you, you mentioned is that I ended up moving to San Diego, living next to a law school. And my intuition was like, you're going to be so jealous of the people who get to go to that law school. <laughs> it's a very strange thing to think. But again, I'm like super obsessed with school. And I remember one day I was just on a walk and I was like saying to my friend, I was like, what do you think if I go to this law school? And he's like, I think it's probably a good idea. <laughs> and so I called my parents. And I was like, what do you think if I go to law school? And my dad's like, probably the best idea you've ever had. I was like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> but so then I, I decided, okay, like this is, it was August. I said, okay, it was actually a new branch of a law school and that was opening in January. I said, if I can like take the LSAT in October and get in by January and not pay for it, I'll go. Because at this point I'm already a quarter million dollars in debt from medical school. Yeah. And well, that all happened. So I ended up going to law school and after law school, there was the startup year. And then there was the let's quit the startup portion of things. And then I taught, <laughs> then I taught law. And also found out that was not amazing. I think in the intro, you said that I still teach it and maybe that I have that written somewhere in my book, but I no longer at this point teach law. I do this, like I do now when I'm, I do medicine like 10 hours a week and then the rest of the time is full time, quit evangelizing. And I so love it. I love, and actually, you know, I want to ask you a question. Um, actually, I know there's a, a, a lawyer watching at the moment, um, but, um, you know, I, I love, I have a couple of questions, just what you were talking and when you're sharing your own journey, like, it seems like you're motivated by learning, right? And like going to school and, and I guess, you know, for me, I am definitely a self learner in a lot of ways. I, I wish I could go back to school, but at the same time, I feel like the academic realm is not necessarily fitted to me. Um, and I just don't gel with it necessarily. But, you know, what do you think along the way has been your motivators? Like, has it been the financial side? Has it been, um, you know, determination to like, you know, do things that are extremely challenging? Like, what do you see as like a core motivator of yours in everything from your, your past career experience? And even now, like, what is it that motivates and drives you to do everything that you've done and just keep going and just keep trying? I'd say there's like many different motivators depending on what you're talking about. Like what I will start with the first part of that, which is what motivated me prior to what I'm doing now, because like everything prior to figuring out that talking about quitting is my extreme passion was just a job or just what I thought might've been my passion. You know, that's the whole thing with quitting is you don't wake up one day 
most people do not wake up one day knowing what your passion is. You know, it's not like a gift we're given at high school graduation. Like you shall be this. (laughs) And um, so I will be very honest about what drove other things. And this is what a lot of, I talk about in in quitting, if you're going to quit law or medicine or one of these things that people like society puts you up on this pedestal, they'd say, but why would you quit it? You definitely went in it to help people. Like, yeah, that's part of it. But again, remember that wasn't on the list of things I just told you, you know, like the list was security, something that had more school, something that had mobility, like, yeah, you have to want to help people in there, but it's not everybody's first motivator. I'm going to be very honest about that. Totally. And, yeah. And law, you, you get to help people and you also have fin- not as much financial stability because man, there are so many lawyers because there are so many law schools cranking out lawyers from the legitimate law school to the less legitimate law schools. And so like now there's kind of an influx of that. So law is not the place to go looking for your security. Uh, and it's a great place to accrue debt, I think. But like I said, I was not going to pay for that. Luckily, I didn't have to. But um, yes, warning everybody in pre-law, it's not some kind of cash cow. But there are a lot of... Um, those motivators. And then let's be very honest here. I I mean, because I just had a podcast guest that I recorded who brought up something called his Superman shadow. And it was one of the most genius concepts I've heard of, but a lot of us achieve to fix some hole or to overcome some childhood, something or another. Right. And there's a lot of us walk around with the, I'm not good enough somewhere. And what a great way to like fix the, I'm not good enough than to get like every societal badge that says you are, you know, like, he who dies with the most degrees wins. It may have crossed my head at some point, you know, because I thought, okay, like essentially in the job market or whatever, scarcity should in- increase your income, right? Like, and there are not that many doctor lawyers. And my dad was a big one on this. He's like, oh my gosh, if you get a law degree on top of your medical degree. People are going to be kicking down your door. <laughs> Nobody has kicked down my, do- literally, he just thought like things would just come flying in. And I was like, there. Let's talk about the reality of things. There's no registry that doctor lawyers go into that notifies people. Like when I get my law degree, law jobs might come my way, but they're not going to know I'm a doctor. So they're not going to come more my way than anybody else. Like society isn't like that. So yeah, maybe it looks cool that I have both and it would be very good for a very specific set of jobs, but the money does not like come pouring in just from getting more degrees. I'm being very blunt with all you guys. Welcome to 6.11 (laughs) (laughs) a.m. That's the whole thing is that why am I so passionate about quitting is that these are two places where people get very, very stuck. You know, you spend a quarter million and 10 years is what it took for me to get from nothing to being a doctor or to being a sports medicine doctor. You spend that much time, people are like going to be clinging onto that thing, even if it makes them miserable. Same thing with law. You put a bunch of money in it. You put a bunch of years and it may not be what you love and that's okay. You know, we do things for certain reasons. We may not realize at the time, I'm not sitting there in 1998 thinking like, what does my, sh- my Superman shadow want in a career? Like you're just doing things. And then like you do the self-examination later and think like, oh, that might be why I did it. But now I'm in this and now we have to like, okay, is it time to pivot, redirect? Make a quiz. It's so true. And I mean, I know I went through something, you know, I, I didn't get a doctor or a, a lawyer degree, which, you know, but for me, it was like really this whole year of just experimenting and sort of saying yes to as many things as possible. Um, and then really from there being able to see adjacent possibilities and go, okay, these are areas that I might be interested in, or these are areas that I see a lot of people are looking at. And I think that's something we're going to touch on a little bit later is like, you know, all of your experience sort of gives you that ability to give those side jobs or those experiences gave you the chance to go, okay, this is what I like to do. This is what I don't like to do. And this is what I want to do. Right. Um, so I think, you know, that's something that a lot of people sometimes feel they need to make a decision and it's got to be the final decision versus sort of kind of just going in and being like, I'm going to say yes to this right now and I'm going to take it as far as it goes and as far as it feels right. Um, but so much fear and, and self-doubt um, also comes into the picture, right? And then there's also the, the sense of risk and some people's level of risk is higher than others. So, you know, I'd love you to just touch on that a little bit more. Like, what did you learn as, as you were going through, right, that you love to do, that you didn't love to do, and that you really wanted to do? In medicine, like I said before, I knew what I didn't want to do, and I didn't want to give obscene chunks of my time, my, my supposed free time, to a job. Like, I have so many hobbies, if you can't see in the background. Like, <laughs> I 
do all kinds of, even Bernie Sanders was at some point in time, a hobby of mine. I was a Bernie Sanders delegate. Um, all these things take time and I love my time. And in medicine, I, I realized like doing it was not giving me some kind of, and we didn't have a name for it. And that's, well, maybe somebody did at the time, but I didn't know it, but like the flow state, that's what I think your ultimate career goal should be is to wake up and get to do something that puts you at or very near your flow state and medicine was a constant state of friction for me and that's what I learned it's like this model of seeing patients especially the model that I was in because I, I did residency at the Mayo Clinic and we had to see somebody like every 15 minutes and that wasn't happening because the patients there were very sick like they were there for a reason and then I went to sports medicine where I had to see that in between the athletes well the athletes would call the athletes would call with an emergency, like their trainers or whatever. We work for the Diamondbacks. I have like spares the Diamondbacks on probably every podcast I've done, but their, their trainers would call. We were working with them and they'd be like, you need to come here immediately. And I'm like in the middle of a full clinic and I would like go across the street to their training facility and I'd be like, what, what, what's going on? Oh, they need an allergy shot. And we're not talking like an EpiPen, they're currently dying allergy shot. Just like, no, nah, they're sniffling. And I was like, I left a full clinic for this. Like the, the sports medicine sense of urgency was not my sense of urgency. <laughs> this is not an emergency. So I learned like, okay, I don't want to work with people who have grossly different mindsets from mine. And then um, I went through law school and then I ended up doing a startup. And a startup had a lot of the things that I was sure was going to make me happy. I wanted to work from a coffee shop that sounded super romantic. I wanted to have flexible <laughs> hours and flexible location. And I wanted to, you know, have some, I never really ne necessarily wanted to work for myself because my dad had worked for himself and we were not wealthy people. And that's what I equated. I was like, do not work for self. He kept saying work for yourself, but I was like, mm, your bank account is telling me a different story. <laughs> and so like, I did the startup, so I wasn't working for myself. I had a founder and I was like co-founder. Right. But what I realized from that was do not work for somebody else in a place where you are not getting paid. Right. Because I worked in the startup for a year and that's normal, right? To not get paid in the first year. But the contract we had set up definitely had me getting paid in that first year. And so since I wasn't the one, you know, like the bucks didn't stop with me, somebody else got to keep changing my contract, even though I had written the contract. And I was like, no, okay you're never again going to put your financial situation in somebody else's hands. You know, that was, that was just a lesson learned there. Yes. The coffee shop life was romantic, but on the other hand, you can work from any time that meant he could call me at 11 o'clock at night, the founder and you know, okay, we got this issues going on. It, it wasn't, it didn't, I couldn't check out ever, you know? Yeah. So I learned that portion of, okay, you don't necessarily want to work for somebody else under these circumstances. Yeah. And so, um, what essentially I have just told you are a bunch of things I don't want, which is why I'm the quitting expert, because that's what, that's why you quit and find out what you don't want. You know, I mean, I found out things that I do want because when I finally got to the point where it was, I taught law for a few semesters, but right before the last semester, I listened to a podcast, I believe, and I should, I, I quote this enough, I should look this up, but I believe it was Seth Godin on the Tim Ferriss podcast. Right. And they were talking about like your legend or something along those lines. And it, I think it was kind of this find your passion type discussion but like the how and I think Seth said if you can't figure it out ask your friends ask your friends what they think of when they think of you you are the blank person in their life right and so I went to Facebook after that podcast and I was like hey guys um looking for some thoughts you know I have a semester off because this is when the election 2016 election was happening and I was volunteering in that that's why I had not taught law that semester and I was like you know, I'm essentially kind of free-ish. I had just gotten off the, the DNC doing the Bernie stuff. And I was like, Bernie's out. So now I've got some time. What do you see for my future? Should I write a book? Should I start a nonprofit? Should I start giving talks? Because I've like, since I was on the speech team since fifth grade and not since fifth grade, fifth grade to like whatever the speech team ends in grade school. But I was really good at that and I was very fond of it and I love public speaking and I got to give the speech at my law school graduation which I did on quitting and uh I was like oh I just love public speaking so I put that in one of my things and it's funny that I looked back the other day and two out of the four things that I had put as options are what I'm currently doing and Amazing. whether or not people like yeah had commented oh you should do that some of them commented um write a book which I did um but that's that's kind of how I just like, discovered my passion and in that process though, I just like wrote down a list of things that I 
like like to do and a list of things that I was good at because I had even though I just told you a thousand things I don't like to do like I said there are things I like to do I like giving advice not necessarily in the oh my god every five, 15 minutes and then I write a prescription at the end version but I did like that part of medicine and then I love public speaking and then on the things that I was good at list number one on the top of the list was quitting and when I looked at those two lists I'm like I'm gonna find a way to combine these two things and I have and we're here Amazing. And I, you know, it's so interesting. I mean, I think that's something we always say too, to our students who join our online course. It's really about looking at what are your strengths, what do you enjoy doing, but also asking for feedback, right? And really reaching out. Like the other day, I was just running a personal branding workshop, but even in our navigating career workshop, it's, it's always looking at how do you ask feedback from your friends or ex-colleagues and looking at what are the things that they see you as being good at, right? Or how did they envision yourself? Or if they were to share three words or four words about yourself, what would that be? So, you know, I want to talk and uh, talk more about how you started your business after all these years, but yeah, there's something that um, when people are changing careers, right, we tend to focus more on like our weaknesses. However, you were really looking at, you know, the, the strengths that you had and from your experience, what do you think were the transferable skills that helped you shift from one industry to another to sort of help you reinvent yourself um, from media, multimedia into law? The multimedia skills that essentially lay dormant for like 20 years became very useful because as you two may know, um, and everybody else out there may or may not like when you start something you you are generally starting it by yourself i didn't have any kind of like nest egg to hire another person and so when you at this point look at my podcast artwork i made that um many of the graphics in other places like i was able to hire somebody like to do the website and make some graphics on that end but like the quit happens pot podcast i made all of those graphics and like when i start doing ads or when i was like doing ads for the pre-sale I knew how to make those like because I had the Photoshop background, even though my Photoshop skills were dusty and I had to like use a whole new version because again, 20 years, but like those were super transferable skills that I thought I was necess like never, ne never necessarily going to use again, which is something for people to keep in mind if they ever get almost trapped in the like, what about the time and money I wasted in a thing? Until you're on your deathbed, you do not know that you wasted a thing because it might come back up, you know, yeah. you never know. Yeah. And then transferable skills from medicine. I mean, I do coaching now. So a lot of that is similar, you know, the ability to listen, to assimilate information. Um, the reason there's even a hesitation in me answering this is because I don't know that I got those skills from medicine. I think you have a certain set of skills. Like, for example, um, my friend kind of laughs because whenever he brings up like, oh, maybe a new business partner, this and that, like I'm already 20 steps ahead Googling them. Like I've already figured out their address on a background search. And he's like, oh, that's the lawyer in you. I'm like, no, that's why I became a lawyer. Like be yeah. for an excuse to do that. Like, so I don't know that, that pick I picked up those skills. I think I just was able to take advantage of those skills in those fields. And I'm sorry, I, I don't have a ton I more. Mean, it's so true, right? I think some things are so innate in people. And, you know, something we always say is that, like, the technical skills are, are really a small part of us, right? But then there's the, the innate skills or our personality or characteristics. And then, of course, there are things that we pick up along from our, our, our experience when we were younger or different career sort of experiences that we've had. So I think it's really just re-looking at the way that we package ourselves or see the skills and, and who we are um, in order to sort of move into the direction that you want to. But all right, let's get into more about your business and what you do. So like you are now a proud, the proud quitter, a professional quitter. Um, and I freaking love it. Um, and I'm just making boss. that a thing like that. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. So you're your own boss at quitting by design. You do coaching, you've authored a book, um, you speak, you have your own podcast. Um, yeah, and, and I, I great that you have it right there. Um, so I do want you to share more about that as well towards the end um, where people can get it or find out more information. But you know, what made you start your own business from what I've understood is that you were just quitting all the time and people were asking you as well and you were doing a lot of public speaking, but really like what was that turning point 
um, for you to be like, okay, I need to do this. I need to turn this into a business. Like, did you just wake up one morning and be like, I got to do this? Or was it sort of a process? And maybe you could just take us through like a little bit of that process. So it absolutely started with that Facebook discussion that I was having. Um, somewhere in there, I was talking with my friend David G. Uh, he and I had been in a Brazilian band together at some point, his band. I had just played percussion on the side. And uh, he's a good friend. And I was telling him I'm having this kind of, you know, not crisis, but you know, like this, this time of, of like, okay, really self-introspection. What am I going to do from here? Because I was, I don't know, 39, I think at the time, 38. And uh, he was like, let's meet up. I was like, okay. So we're going to meet at a Starbucks and I got there first. And so I'm sitting in my car and I had this notebook and a pen. And that's literally what I did when I mentioned a second ago, one piece of paper, what I like, one piece of paper, what I'm good at. And what I didn't write, but had firmly in my mind, but other people have since recommended, put a little corner in that same thing and put what you hate. That's huge. Like don't redo whatever you learned from your quits that you don't like, you know? Um, but those were all firmly in my mind. But so I had those two pieces of paper and then he shows up and we go into the Starbucks and we just start hashing it out. And he was a web is, um, well, he's a designer of all times, but he was like, we didn't know what it would look like, but we knew that there was a way to combine these things. He's like, maybe you do webinars, you know, you're you love public speaking. You definitely do speaking. Um, I don't know if a podcast even came up or if a, a book came up, but at the time it was just kind of this amorphous blob, but it was a start, you know, he's like, we'll take some photographs. We'll make just like a series. And so there's like, we did, we did 10 videos that were like a minute long video. He's like, we'll create micro content for Facebook <laughs> but to lead people to what we didn't know. Like that's, that's what I love to, to tell people is like, you don't need to know exactly what it looks like immediately because it will morph. Right. And so we, you know, we, we get the website up. And so all I have at this point is like a website. I'm not thinking like, I'm going to be CEO of my own business. It was literally just like, I want to talk about quitting. How do I do that? We put up a website. And um, from that point, I have the website up and then I was volunteering, like I said, for this uh, election reform. Election reform is one of my, my side passions. And I was volunteering in election reform. This is right before the November 2016 election. And I was going to this place where I was volunteering, but there was a whole ton of downtime. And so in the downtime, I just kept expanding on the 10 videos. And okay, I'm gonna write more and more and more on this, more and more and more on this. And then um, at this point, you know, I'd done a few little talks here and there. And I had a trip to India planned with a friend. This was on my bucket list. Like my bucket list had two things, be on The Daily Show, go to India. And I had already accidentally been on The Daily Show that same year from, from some notorious DNC footage. But here's my India trip. Like my bucket list was gonna be done essentially. And my friend cancels like 10 days before. And I was super devastated. And I met with that same friend, Dave G. And he was like, this is when you write your book. Like you have, I had already taken three weeks off work, you know, even though I don't work that much, but still, you know, it's like the mindset of like three weeks free. And so I did, and I sat down and I took everything I had written and I put it into a book. And then I like, then miraculously, like the next year I got a job in that place. I was volunteering for election law. So all of a sudden I had like two mass, I was working 40 hours a week between the medicine and the election reform. So I didn't have so much time to like get the book out, but I finally got the book, found a publisher that year. And then quit that job at the end of the year and started the podcast. So that's the progression of how things went. It wasn't like I knew what it was going to look like, but once I thought more like, okay, if I want to be a speaker, like what helps on the road to speaking and, oh, look, podcasting is very popular with this set. So let me try that. And podcasting has been my favorite thing. Um, the, the book writing was fun, but the publishing process is less fun. Um, but podcasting is amazing. So like, not that I have any income from the podcasting at this point, it's just my passion, but it helps me get more information to use with my, with my coaching clients and to provide in these kind of interviews like I'm doing now. And it's another great way to just get free content out to people who may be contemplating a quit, but don't necessarily like want to invest in coaching at this time. Maybe they're just like dipping their toe in. So that's my Absolutely. profession. And I think that like what you shared, you know, one on the whole side, it's a lot of people fear like they need to have the end picture or the end goal in line before they sort of make the leap. But a lot of the times it really is just about getting started and actioning, right? Like we, we totally are big believers of like action is king. Um, and it's, you just don't know how it's going to morph. I mean, even when we started the change school, it started in a very different way, running retreats to, to where it is today. But I think the other point that you really brought up that I think sometimes we forget is when you're building a brand or when you're building something that is greater 
it's really about providing value to the people that you are connecting with or that you felt is where you're wanting to like build your space, right? And, and value these days are so multidimensional. There's so much free content out there, but interviewing people, which is, which is why also we love doing the Change School TV, right? It's really an opportunity for us to hear other people's stories of change, such as yourself and many of the others that we've spoken to, but also provide like practical tips. Um, and for some people, it's a process, right? The, the cycle of change doesn't always happen like for you, right? Where it's like, okay, this is what I know, know I don't want, I'm gonna do this. For some people, it may take them like six months. We've, we've worked, we've had people who came to us four years ago for a short course and only four years later, we're really ready to like make the leap, right? But through our content or through various other things, like people start feeling more comfortable um, and they've taken these small steps. So podcasting is such a big, um, a big space and it really is something that people love to do when they're on their way to work or when they're coming back from work and maybe they're depressed or unhappy in their job, you know, listening on the, on the tube or wherever it is. So I think, um, you know, all of these things add value to people in different ways. Um, so, okay, you have, you know, been quitting multiple times, you've quit multiple times, and from your experience with coaching as well as just, you know, your own experience, what do you feel are some of the biggest struggles people face when it comes to quitting um, something in their life? And, you know, maybe you can also share more about your business, Quitting by Design, and, and how, you, how you work um, in that as well. Um, and I'm going to, like... It's a little confusing. I don't know that my business even has a name. Quitting by Design is just like what the website says and what the book says, but that's again, because the fact that like we didn't have a whatever when we started, like the website was called lynnmariemorski.com and David G, as he and I were meeting one day for like website thoughts, I was like, what do you think about the name Quitting by Design? It's like, oh, I like that. So we bought that URL and now it redirects there. But like, I don't, my, I'm registered as Morsky Consulting S Corp <laughs> somewhere, you know, like, awesome. but, but, yeah, it's just, it's just me. Um, the, your question was the, oh, the, the, what, like, what is keeping people? Many things. Number one is the stigma around quitting, depending on uh, what it is that they're quitting. They may have this fear. Like, this is where I tend to differ from many business, you know, experts or advice givers is they'll be like, you know, stay in something at least two years or stay at least one year so that your resume doesn't have these holes. I wouldn't call somebody who has less than a year on their resume. Then you don't want to work for that person. You know, like if you're in a job that makes you miserable, do not, there's no badge of honor besides your LinkedIn, your resume portion of things that, that you need to keep that job. Like your health is more important every single day than that job is, you know, like no day of your life should be given. You should just give away your health to some other job because you think, oh, like my, a future employer may look at this, you know, like if you, if you get to a future employer and you have that conversation, tell them what was happening there. Like, this is why it was a toxic environment and I couldn't stay. I don't, I don't know. Uh, this is where, like, like I said, we def I definitely differ from lots of people on that, but I just think there shouldn't be a stigma around quitting because if you're quitting for the right reasons and you're quitting strategically, like you said, it might be a four year quit. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be overnight by any means. It probably shouldn't be for you to make sure you don't land on the street, you know? Um, but number one is getting over the stigma of quitting. Number two are the fears. Fears could be fear of what other people will think, uh, fear of the unknown, fear of failure. Uh, another one is just the, it's not necessarily a fear, but the question I was talking about earlier about like what all that time or money I wasted, what, you know, should I, I don't want to waste something. That's like a concern that they have. And yeah. then, and then it gets into the logistics. Like you said, there's financial fears. Like, how am I going to prepare my finances and make it out on the other side? How am I going to make it through that transition? What if I don't make money on the other side? And um, then the final kind of group of fears are just like, how do I go into my boss and say this? And do I do it in an email? Do I walk in, you know, yeah. into those categories generally. And so you help people, you know, can you talk us through a little bit more like how right now you're, you're helping people, um, you know, be successful at quitting um, and the one and, and really being able to, I guess, live that life that they're, that they're looking for. 
So what I advocate for, the strategic quitting I was just talking about, has five steps. And I, what I, the fears I just talked about kind of fall into those five. But step number one that I help them with is to decide whether or not there's something that needs to be quit. That may or may not be obvious. They may just feel like a sense of unrest. That's what I say. I don't say like, come to me if you know there's something you need to quit. I say, come to me if you have a sense of feeling stuck somewhere in your life. Yeah. feeling of unrest or maybe just the feeling of as my friend Dominic calls in his book um, a feeling of drifting you know uh, today's like tomorrow like the next day there's nothing exciting nothing lights you up well there may be something that you need to quit to maybe get yourself out of the comfort zone so that something does light you up and uh, we start there and then from there in strategic quitting you don't just up and quit the whole thing by the way we're talking in the change school about careers but this can apply to relationships cities yeah. mindsets um, Food, beliefs. health, yeah. Food, health, yeah. I have quit the ketogenic diet. I have quit overindulging in health information. You know, like that's mm -hmm. not a, a great place to be for your health when you spend all day long just, what should I do for diet? What should I do for exercise? Like that, your cortisol level so high that no matter what diet or exercise you do, you're going to gain weight. Like that's that huge quit in my life. But so we dial down like, okay, do you need to quit? We'll use career as an example. Do you need to quit the entire career or is it maybe just this job? And if it's this job, is it really the job or is it maybe the commute? Like if you yeah. love your career and love your job, but you can't handle this two hour commute you have. I had one, one of my podcast guests, she worked at X and her commute was something like two hours from San Francisco or something. And that's not like a dream job, but with a nightmare commute, right? Yeah. So maybe you go in as she had done and say, can I work from home a few days? Like at this day and age, it's really hard to say, no, you can't ever work from home. Like there's so few things that have to be in person, you know? Yeah. So drill down what it is that you don't like because you don't want to throw out more than you have to. Quitting is not easy. You know, what's easier going to your boss and asking to work from home or finding an entire new job, you know? So I dive down in there with them. Like what exactly is causing this distress? And then from there, we, like I said, we, we talk about the fears and this is where we really get into the quit on quit on quit because you're probably going to have to quit some beliefs you had to get yeah. over those fears. Your belief may be that the, the typical or the ideal success story in the US is uh, I get this job nine to five, I have it all my life, I have the wife and the two kids by 32 or whatever, you know, the picket fence, like it may require you quitting that version of success and redefining your own. It, it should, you know, at some point, if that, were, if that is ever your thought of success, definitely quit that and redefine it for yourself you can redefine it to the exact same thing but at least it's on your terms and not just because that's what like the media and society has sold you for so many years absolutely yeah so that's a huge part of quitting is getting down into like why haven't you quit at this point is it the uh su sunk cost fallacy which is the oh i've already spent so much time and money i should continue to spend time and money into this thing a lot of people think that way you've heard people in relationships why are you stinking around well i've already been there three years yeah. Well, you, were, you want to spend three more miserable years? Like that, the math has, that's like in the innate gift section, the fact that like quitting has never been a stigma thing for me. Like whenever people would say that to me, like, well, but I've already been, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense at all. Like the math there does not check out. You're not happy now. You're going to be more happy if you donate three more years of your life to this guy. Like, so same thing with, you know, loss firm, like, oh, but I put so many years in this firm. And I'm like, so if you're not happy now, are you going to be happy when your head's like your name's on the letterhead and the outside of the building? Because at that point, it's a lot harder to quit. It is way messier when you are a partner and you signed all kinds of contracts and you're going to be responsible financially if they have to redo the front of the building, you know, like quit when you realize it's not working for you. Do not get stuck in these like um, just the erroneous path, erroneous paths of thinking. So that's a lot of what I do is just unravel those because that's the hardest part. Generally, it's the fine, like preparing your finances may actually be hard. You know, you may have to do a second job or this and that, but like, it doesn't necessarily take the, the mental work and the inner delve that the overcoming the fears does. Absolutely. And I think you're so spot on there, right? Like a lot of it starts just any type of change is really starting with the mindset um, and having that support system. And, you know, I, we're all big believers of, or myself and soul and us at the change school are definitely big believers of like value investing in yourself. Right. And a lot of, all, a lot of things start with your mindset. 
Um, and when we can reframe that, when we can retrain it, um, everything else sort of tends to have a domino effect, right? And there are always ways, uh, once the why is clear, the how becomes easier, right? Um, yep. So love it. And, you know, I've, I've taken some notes down and that's definitely something we're going to share as well, um, you know, in the comments later. But You've got a book coming out, Quitting by Design. You just gave us a little peek of it earlier, but it'd be great for us to know more around when is it coming? And yeah, definitely put it, hold it up there on the screen. You know, um, it's great. I, I can't wait to get a copy myself. Um, so you've got the book coming out. Can you share more about where, uh, when, what's just maybe even a snippet? Um, can we get like a chapter or two or, you know, is there any way we can get access to this book soon? Um, and all the deeps. Yes. So if you go to quittingbydesign.com right now, you can either scroll down to the bottom or if you wait, a little pop-up will appear. And if you put your email in there, you will get a chapter of the book in your inbox. And it is, and it's funny because I think my coach thinks I have picked the most random chapter to, to, to bestow upon people, but it's a chapter about preparing your finances. And for me, that's one of the most concrete chapters. It's not necessarily indicative of the rest of the book. The rest of the book is a little bit more comical, maybe a little bit because, I mean, you've met me. Like, I'm a little bit flippant about some of these things, you know, because I'm so passionate about it that, like, the stigma about quitting just does not occur to me. So I may put it in those same kind of terms, like, come on, let's, let's do what's best for you and not whatever. Because society, like, for example, what I always say is, like, when they think, okay, what are, what are people going to think about about me quitting, I'm going to say, well, not much because they're, they're going to go right back to their Instagram in like two seconds after you tell them, you know, like in our society, unless it's something is like an earthquake, it, it's, it's in somebody else, somebody else's purview for like two seconds. They'll think about it unless they're your parents or they're your dependents and then they're going to move on, you know, so that kind of advice is in the rest of the book. The book goes through, let's see if there's this even like a table of contents. Mm, I'm no, there's, there's somehow not even a table come to me if you want advice about publishers <laughs> side note um but yeah like it talks about exactly what i had described was it goes into how to know if there's something you should quit how to get over the stigma of quitting how to get through each of those fears the time and money wasted all of those things and then the the chapter that you will get if you put your email in like i said is the preparing your finances for a quit two people that have been on my podcast were cpas and one became an actor and one became a professional beer brewer. And yeah. And so I got to talk to them about their quits, but also on the side was like any financial advice for the peeps <laughs> and they gave some great tips that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have thought of. Um, so that's what you can find in the book. So if you go ahead and put your email in there, the book comes out Friday, the 20th. Amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. And so once your email is in there, the second that it is on Amazon or even earlier, because I am going to call them today and beg for a presale link, but I will send something to that, to your email, and then you can buy it from there. And that's physical copy as well as e ebook. <laughs> <laughs> Again, our convo about the publishers. It is a physical <laughs> copy at this point. No, no, that's great. Just, you know, some people always think it's like ebook, but you've got a physical copy there. So just wanted to clarify. Yeah. If you go, like when I send you a chapter, that will be a PDF. And when you put your email in and I send you an email about where to buy it, it will be in hardback or paperback form initially. But I did a presale through Publishizer. Publishizer is the loveliest group. Love on them. Yeah, totally. Right? It's amazing. Yeah. Giant plug for Lee and Publishizer. And in that presale, I pre-sold a ton of eBooks and the publisher sent me uh, a little flyer that said I could buy eBooks of my book. And then I called them and they said, that's not a thing. So I'm working on the eBook version because it's, I talked to Lee again from, I went back to Publishizer, like, what do I do about this eBook situation? I pre-sold many of them. And so he told me how to make that happen. So the point is there will be an eBook, but maybe Friday the 28th is not the day that that eBook exists. But the link will be there. The link to Amazon where any form of the book will appear will be in that email. And you know what? I, I love physical books. So I, I, I'm a big physical book person. It's just I can't carry like 10 of them whenever I go somewhere. So have yeah. trend to the ebook. It's, I, it's I get that. So it's, nice. Yeah, look at it. Nice. Because I didn't want anybody to quit the book before quitting the thing that they were reading the book about. So it's only like 77 pages because, again, I just wanted to get the basics there. Like, I didn't want you to have to read War and Peace to figure out if you needed to quit your commute, you know? Like, I wanted it to be just the right inf amount of information. And if this, like, what's your whistle for quitting, you just hop on over to the podcast and 
fill in any gaps that there are there. Uh, or you can coach, you know, I do, like I said, coaching, or you can go to my website and some of my old talks are online. But and yeah, so it's just a good start. Your podcast is also Quit Happens. That's available iTunes. Um, you know, we'll share the links as well, as well um, in the comments, but also in our newsletter. But I just, you know, I want to say we're going to share all of this. Um, I just shared the Quitting by Design link in the comments. Thank so for you. those of you that are watching us live, you can head on over there now. If you are catching the replay of this, of course, this is going to be living, you know, forever in the interwebs um, and on YouTube and Facebook. So you will be able to catch that as soon as you watch this. Um, and, you know, I really wanted to just like, I love that, that comment around the stigma of quitting because the Dr. Seuss uh, quote always comes to mind, right? It's like, um, be who you are and say what you feel because those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. So um, that just reminds me of what you're talking about because it's so true, right? Sometimes we're so worried about or concerned about what other people are thinking. And I mean, I, I go through that, everyone goes through it and it's just needing that reminder. So love the, the five steps that I'm, um, I'm sure everyone's going to enjoy as well um, in your book. So any final tips? I know you've got to rush off. It's like you've been up so early. So I thank you. And I know you've got a ton of other things going on. So any final tips for like life transitioners, career shifters, or um, obviously a lot of the people that are watching our show are kind of in transition in their careers most of the time. So what do you say last final tips? I would say quitting is not a dirty word. Settling is the dirty word here. Like, do not settle. You get one life. Do not end up on your deathbed wishing you had done something else, wishing you had spent more time with your family or friends or, on, in my case, on your hobbies, but you couldn't because of your job. Like, in today's day and age, in this very interesting economy, if you are like a... Uh, uh, bird hair designer you can make a bird hair designing youtube channel and somehow millions of people will watch it and you can monetize that and you will end up at the bird hair designing convention signing autographs like <laughs> you can do so many things with your passions whatever or however obscure they may be in this economy so the onus is on you to like get creative work with whatever kind of coach you need to figure it out but do not settle until you are in or very near a state of flow. Get yourself there. Quit until it has to happen. Love it. And for those of you that are watching us live, you can head on over to quittingbydesign.com and that will uh, direct you to find Lynn Marie. And if you're interested in her book, obviously, you know, get on that list. Be the first to find out. Um, otherwise, there's a range of other um, areas that Lynn Marie can help you with. Um, we're going to share all of that in the comments, but I just want to sort of wrap up tonight and say thank you so much, Lynn Marie, for sharing your time, waking up so goddamn early um, and still looking amazing and, you know, not like half asleep. Um, so thank you. And for those of you that are watching us tonight, I know we started a little bit later, but you know why now. Um, and I also had no idea it was that early there. So I feel terrible, but we, we loved having you on here. Um, and we're going to see the rest of you uh, next week. Let me just make sure there are no comments because I know we had a few people watching. Um, uh, just hello, such cool sharing. Okay. Um, Lynn Marie, if you want to, and you have time, head on over to our comments and there's other people that have, um, have watched us live tonight but thanks guys thank you so much and we love our monday mojo resets and we will see you next week um same time well a little earlier our usual time of 8 30 p.m gmt and um enjoy the rest of the week and if you fancy quitting this week you know where to go um, and for those of you last minute that are interested in our self-paced course, you can head on over to bit.ly forward slash BCM light um, and make your bold moves. Um, so again, thank you so much. And Lynn, thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Yes. Thank you so much for having me on. All right, guys. Have a great night. Bye.